This conference will now be recorded. Okay, then. We're recording. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for joining. Um, this is a, a, a webinar today about a new book out that uh, Liz McGahee and I put together called Integrating Money and Meaning, Practices for a Heart-Centered Life. Um, we're very excited to share it with you. Um, uh, I'll start just by saying that the book is is um, kind of kind of three things. It's 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 three sort of parts. One is um, a, a bit of a memoir uh, of mine, um, and we chose to use that kind of format because we felt like um, when you offer a story of a person's life or some portion of a story, it invites other people to think about their own stories in relationship to these things. So we kind of wove it together that way with, uh, with my own story. Uh, it's partly kind of uh, theories of money. What is money? Philosophy of money. Um, what does it mean? Uh, and the complexities of how we interact with it. And then the third part are practices that we invite people to do. And we're actually in process working on a um, kind of companion workbook that would go with this for folks who want to use it uh, that way um, and have a little bit more space to you know, write in a workbook on some of the exercises or even draw or do various things in relationship to um, some of the practices we're offering. The, the, the last thing I'll say about that is we're also working with a, um, a colleague of my partner, Wendy's, out here at San Francisco Theological Seminary. Her name is um, Marsha McPhee, and Marsha is a, um, a liturgist, so she is a professor of liturgical studies, sort of ritual studies, and she also um, runs a business called Worship Design Studio that designs, um, kind of like what it sounds like, it designs liturgies for predominantly uh, liberal Protestant denominations like United Methodists and uh, Lutherans and uh, Presbyterian folks. And she'll package, she'll do a whole sort of liturgical package, say for Lent uh, or for um, uh, Advent, different holidays, Christian seasons. She very she has very frequently gotten calls for um, packages for stewardship and never had anything to offer. And she's going to use our book as a uh, as a model for a four week stewardship uh, uh, liturgical package that she's offering. So we're really excited about that. Part of a lot of this book and a lot of the practices um, came out of um, workshops I've done in the past with um, communities of faith and also um, uh, things I've done at the Candler School of Theology. Um, I graduated from there eons ago now. <laughs> that seems like a whole nother life, but I did some things postgraduate there when I was um, you know, still living in Atlanta full time. They asked me to come and do some workshops there. So I did some workshops there. So um, I want to also say something I think is really important. Uh, and I said this, we did a live version of this a few weeks ago back in Atlanta. The book does not happen for me without the support and um, work of Liz McGahey. And I just feel, you know, that it's, I get the big, you know, if you look on my, my, the size of my font is larger than hers, but that's only because it's, something about my story but in point of fact if if liz hadn't had the dedication and the love and the commitment to the project it never would have happened so i really want to um, say again thank you very much liz for your involvement here and perhaps um you know once I, i'm going to do just a quick read of some sections of this um but i'm going to invite folks to ask questions and um, you may have questions also for Liz. Um, and I want to make sure that Liz has an opportunity to speak to anything you might, you might raise. And she's saying you're welcome. So in terms of questions, if questions occur to you as I'm talking um, or after I'm done doing this little section of reading, um, I'd invite you to, um, there's a, at the bottom of the panel for the GoToMeeting, there's a chat feature. And you can just write the question in there. Um, 
it looks to me like we're a relatively small group, so another opportunity, perhaps, in, depending on how many folks join towards the end, if we just want to have a conversation, we can do that too. Um, but we do have that chat feature. So I'm going to just do a little reading, short, about five minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up for a conversation. This fish was bigger even than any whale we know, as big as a mountain, and it had an equally enormous appetite. It ate and ate and ate until it had eaten all the food left in the kingdom. And then it roared at the king for more. The image of a leviathan so enormous it can devour people, ships, even entire kingdoms can be found throughout the world's mythology and literature. In many of these stories, Jonah and Pinocchio come to mind, people exist inside the belly of the colossal beast, perhaps unaware of their captivity, much less imagining any avenue of escape. In my many years working in the financial industry, I've thought of this image often. Like King Soleimani's whale, our money system at least in the Western world, is truly colossal, encompassing every economic, social, industrial, and cultural structure that makes up our complex society. Sorry about that. And like Jonah and Pinocchio, we exist inside this daunting money system, often unaware of how it surrounds us and affects not just our daily tasks, but also our inner spirit and the spirit of our communities. I see the effect of living inside this whale every day when I interact with my clients around money. People are worried, stressed, confused, angry, occasionally joyful, but more often fearful when it comes to money. The plethora of seminars, self-help books, and websites promising relief from this kind of anxiety attest to its prevalence in our culture. Unfortunately, this mammoth system is not going anywhere. In fact, each day it grows larger. The web of institutions and policies we've created to interact with money grows in complexity, lack of transparency, and the ability to create haves and have-nots. This web, in turn, props up just about every other aspect of society, including politics, the environment, research, education, religion, food, health, entertainment, art, the list is endless. Nowhere is this rampant expansion more apparent than in the outcome of the 2016 United States presidential election, when a billionaire, supposedly, businessman slash reality TV show host with no experience in politics, squeezed his way into becoming the leader of the free world. Money doesn't just talk, it shouts. Angst around money has certainly been a part of my own life, even though, and partly because, I grew up in a family with plenty of it. Even as a kid, I was aware that while money certainly bought options, it did not deliver happiness. Throughout this book, I offer stories from my own life, as well as the lives of others, that exemplify how money's tendrils reach into every pocket of our being, starting when we are very young. I do this because I think it's helpful to hear stories about how these theoretical issues can play out in the world, but also to bring them out of the shadows and into the light. If we can't see where we are, how can we change where we're going? For now, I'll describe my situation at the age of 37, when I found myself at a crossroads. At that time, I'd been in and out of my family's business several times and sold out my portion of the company, only, only to lose most of the money in a crazy business venture. I'd also seen one important relationship in my life end and another begin, adding more children to the mix. I'd made a career switch and attended divinity in graduate school, then found the doors of that career path closing too. In many ways, my life was in utter shambles, but I had done at least one thing right. I'd added a well-known spiritual practice to my daily routine, meditation. Though I was new to the practice and my mind raced frantically through every short sitting, for some reason I stuck with it. One day as I sat on my cushion, I seemed to be wrestling more than usual with my unruly thoughts, 
most of which were worries about money. Then out of the blue, the waters of my mind calmed and a message emerged. Get up and deal with your money. At first I resisted, trying to force the river of my meditation in another direction. This couldn't be right. Money and spiritual practice don't mix. But soon I stopped resisting and the message became clear. Get up and deal with your money. After the meditation session ended, I lingered over what had just happened. It seemed important, so I decided to listen. I began by looking realistically at my own financial situation and making changes. Later, I took the trainings necessary to help others do the same. I love this work mainly because I believe I'm helping people relieve some of their stress and fear around money. God knows most people need help navigating the guts of this crazy beast. Budgeting, investing, asset management, protection, goal setting, long range planning, and so on. Advocating and helping at such a fundamental level is noble work. Nevertheless, at times I feel like a doctor in a mass unit just stitching up the wounds of an ongoing war. We're in the belly of the beast and it's acidic down here. That's the dark side of the story, but there's another side. My own personal life experiences and my experiences working with others have shown me that it's possible to live inside our money system without being utterly consumed by it. To live within it and still find a level of peace, balance and wisdom, to find meaning. Though it's not the norm, I've met people with that level of health and it has little to do with how much money they have. These people intrigued me. I wanted to know how it was that they were able to thrive in this environment and with what appeared to be relative ease. I examined the phenomena and the answer that emerged was a spiritual path. All of these people had some sort of spiritual practice, but not just that. There are many people who consider themselves to be on a, journey, a spiritual journey, but I noticed that these people included money on that path. Learning how to do that is the purpose of this book. And that's all I'm gonna read because I could read all day, but hopefully you will read or perhaps you have read already and have some questions. So I wanna just take a quick gander at who's on the call and invite you to there's not that many of us. So why don't you all turn on your microphones and um, ask whatever questions you might have or comments you might have if you've already read some of the book. So Maggie, it's Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Um, you know that I will dominate this entire last <laughs> minute that we have asking you questions. <laughs> so don't let me. <laughs> yeah, fair um, one of the questions that I have for you, and I, and I apologize, I have not read the book yet. Um, the, where you left off, so what's so what's the next step? The step is to 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 put together this idea of money and spirituality to make that connection. So how do you do that? Is or is that like read the damn book, Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit read the damn book, Melissa. But <laughs> I guess I want to say that I think that the central for me, the, the central thesis of this book and, and really the central thesis of the workshops I would have done in the past, really pretty simple. And, and it's, it is that dealing with your money at all mm -hmm. with a sense of, um, you know, seeking, uh, seeking to understand what's happening and sort of engaging the anxieties that it can produce mm -hmm. or the, um, uh, the stress or the joy um, is is in and of itself a spiritual practice. So I mean, I I think that things aren't separated. Um, right. And I think that we live in a culture that really wants to separate these things. And and there's lots of reasons why um, it has developed that way. Um, and part of it is that um, money is now directly tied to survival in our culture. Mm -hmm. We've lost the ability to uh, feed ourselves without the assistance of a whole chain of you know, relationships. We've lost the ability to clothe ourselves. We've lost the ability to really sort of support ourselves. I'm going to need to let my dog out of this room. <laughs> This is off, this is not the moment here. If you're watching, just a minute. 
Oh, that humanizes it so much more. Teddy is as fascinated as Teddy is by this conversation. <laughs> oh, you, she too cannot actually. I mean, it's the dog. The dog is a classic example, right? Bred to be completely dependent on another species. Do you imagine how terrifying money would be if we added that to a dog's life? Okay. <laughs> so my the point I'm trying to make here is that because because we're in survival mode when we're dealing with our money now, in a way that we might not have been three generations ago. Um, it's you know every money really triggers the you know the reptilian brain in our interactions, and so finding ways, finding a path to a level of ease requires us to notice that. Um, it also requires us to think deeply about what money is in our life and how it supports the things we love the most mm -hmm. and want the most for ourselves mm -hmm. and others. So anyhow, I could ramble on and on, but read the book. You'll learn. Okay. <laughs> other questions? Comments? Well, I will. Can you hear me now, Maggie? This is Nan. Hi, Nan. Okay. Well, I too have not read the book. I'm very sorry, but I do own it. So I, I've, been, I've been on the road 6,640 uh -huh. miles. So, yeah. um, and I have been um, your fan for many, many, many years, including when you were having that crisis at 37. Yes, so, four. right. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I was having my own crises about money and you have guided me along this way so beautifully. Um, I feel like I n need to go into um, a new, uh, go back to Maggie 1.0 or read this book. Um, I'm at a place with, I've been retired three and a half years. Um, it's so difficult because I worked most of my life since I was 15. It's been so difficult for me to adjust to not getting a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm, it's, um, I need to get a grip on this and learn that I do have enough money um, and be, continue to be wise about spending it. Um, so I guess it's the retirement issue that, that most of my friends have probably been through unless, unless they're people with bunches of money. Yeah, even ones with bunches of money though, I would argue um, it's still, a, it's, a, it's an enormous transition. Yeah. And it's a transition that um, is still very new to humankind, mm -hmm. like like two seconds ago, when you think about it. I mean, think about, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, right? I mean, we didn't used to live this long. And we didn't used to um, have to store up, you know, funds to support us. This whole activity is a brand new activity in human history. So it's not surprising that it's uh, anxiety provoking or, you know, mm -hmm. to me, I mean, when you think about it, it's like how many generations lived as long as the generations do now? Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, when they first built Social Security, they, they, they built it on the idea that, you know, most people would be dead by their later 60s. Mm hmm. Which is why this retirement age was like 65, because they weren't worried about trying to keep people in money for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it, I think that um, it's understandable. I think that, but the, but I but I would also argue that the way to cope with it is what you're doing, which is like mm -hmm. face it and not just let right. kind of eat you up. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've known you a long time, and you're the one who told if I may say this i mean you talked to me early on about how like for example paying your bills was a kind of spiritual practice right mm -hmm. yeah in the morning is that am, mm -hmm. I, am I remembering yeah. you in the right. morning in yeah. sunday morning um yeah. with chant music playing <laughs> yeah i don't yeah. do that so much anymore because they're all automatically you yeah. know 
coming out of my account. Yeah. But, That's um, the disadvantage of that delinkage of a um, kind of materiality with our money too. I mean that mm -hmm. you know um, you know think about how meta, if you will, money has become. Mm -hmm. It's blitz on a screen. You know it's gone from something you hold in your hand. Mm -hmm. A check writing, which still was something you did, yeah. to you know, automation, and it's all just very ghostly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it functions. I don't know. The, frankly, the more I think about money, in some ways, and sort of how it functions, it the more complex it gets for me. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe there... this is Dell. Hi, Dell. Hi. Um, one question I have is, um, so do you see part of your role as a financial planner? How do you go about addressing the spiritual with people? And obviously I'm guessing you need to define that in many different ways. Um, because there's a lot of people that I mean, it's very common nowadays to say I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, right? Mm. And and so I'm just curious about how you would address that. Yeah, I, I'd like you to say a little bit more about that. That's interesting to think about. I think about gratitude as one part of um, my money spiritual practice is gratitude for the successes I've had in my career and the stability and um, what it's provided for me. But anyway, so I, I'm just curious about how you how you talk about that with people. So, yeah, I think it's a great question. And I, I started in the um, when I started in this work 17 years ago. Now, I had a vision of doing what I call pastoral care with money. Mm. Right. <laughs> the idea being. <clears throat> that I felt like I really um, could appreciate how, well, I'll, I'll give you a tangible example. You know, um, I myself, as I, as I speak about in this book, really had very, very conflicted views of um, money. I was very avoidant. Um, I didn't, uh, it, 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 it felt like to me a necessary evil um, I was uncomfortable with, um, I was uncomfortable both with having it and not having it, right? You know, the, <clears throat> and, and I felt a lot of just churning and stress and anxiety and discomfort and, you know, I grew up in a, in an area that was, um, uh, very, like, demonstrably poor, you know, like, um, 80% of the kids in my high school were on some, or in elementary school too, were on some form of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, of my 175 member graduating class of 1980, 10 went to college. Wow. Um, and of those, I don't know how many actually made it all the way through. So, I mean, my family was by, um, by Atlanta standards, not particularly affluent by Marin County, where I stand today, by those standards was like definitely not affluent. But relative to my little hometown, they were very affluent. And so um, so I grew up with this kind of disconnect there in a way that made me feel really deeply uncomfortable. Um, so when I had this sort of like, oh, this sort of moment of recognition of my own dis-ease and my own and the disconnection in my life between this money life and this reality and my religious life that I was experiencing and this call to like get up and deal with my money, I, I thought, the first thing I thought was, I can't be the only one who feels this bad. Mm -hmm. This must be a broader phenomenon, right? I'm not like the only person on the planet that feels this way. And so initially it was just like, how, am, how can I be with people as they face that? those things, right? So the pastoral care was just, how am I, you know, how am I open to having the conversation and supporting people in that? So it was, it was initially not so, like, how do I more deeply integrate spiritual concepts into the relationship? It was more just pretty simply, how do I show up 
explore this work because it seems to be what my vocation truly is, personally. Mm -hmm. And then over time, what I realized is, or what began to happen is people that were drawn, you know, people just get drawn to you. I mean, you know, you like attracts like in a sense. And so people that want to re kind of resonate with that um, and you have a certain amount of anxiety or whatever, they're drawn to you. And that's what happened. My practice grew with folks who wanted to have that level of conversation and wanted to be able to feel comfortable saying, I'm anxious or I'm worried or I'm conflicted or this is creating issues in my life. And, it, and then eventually it's, this is creating issues in my life spiritually. And, and so, you know, so even to this day, how I do it is more just inviting the, the conversation um, more than like systemically. You know, I've thought about whether or not I should be doing this more in a sense systematically. Um, but to date, I haven't really figured out how to do that because not everyone, not everyone who shows up, you know, is ready initially to have that kind of conversation or is looking for that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, what I'm the kind of conversation I'm also hoping for is a sort of transformational conversation where it isn't just about care, but it also is, well, how do we think about change in the midst of that? And so part of this book is. Uh, reflect some some exercises and practices that I've picked up from all over the place. Um, you know, different things I've done myself, other things I've uh, I've used in workshops. Um, there's even some reference in here to, uh, to some work I did with the Animus Valley Institute, which was a kind of nature-based um, retreat orientation. Um, it wasn't ostensibly anything to do with money, but I learned so much in that. And I had so much, such a profound experience that I speak to some of that in the book. So I don't know if that answers your question, Del, but I mean, part of it is simply showing up and being open to the conversation and looking for the opportunities when it arises. Yeah. Um, and so for some clients, it's, it's a regular conversation. And for some clients, it's very intermittent. And for some clients, it's never really even thematized that way at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I was just curious, partly, you know, in my work, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you know, that's a, you know, when does it come up? How does it come up? Uh, when do I think about it? What do people say? So, yeah. Well, and part of, you know, in terms of like just the facts on the ground, part of how it comes up are things like, you know, the way we do our investing, we're very intentional about saying this is these are the kinds of things we're looking at when we're investing in companies or funds. You know, we have a certain stand on environmental, social, and governance issues. We have a stand on, um, uh, you know, carbon intensity and those sorts of things. Well, you know, those are implicit. Those are those are kind of claims on um, a sort of type of spiritual value. Yeah. And, so, you know, folks either kind of resonate with that and they, they, we talk about it and they, they're onto it or they don't. And if they don't, they don't tend to become clients. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's a sort of self-selection. We're pretty open about what we're up to, you know. And I often say that um, I, I, mean, I feel extremely fortunate with the client base we have. I mean... Our clients, for the most part, um, well, not even for the most part, I would say pretty much 100%, really are capable of loving something beyond themselves. You know, they connect to a broader world and they have a care for the, a broader world. And so um, that means we have a much higher probability of having these kinds of conversations or having this integrated into the, into the conversation and and not get just caught up in the numbers the numbers are really important i mean co people come to us for the numbers uh -huh. um, but then there's this other thing that we're trying to do and uh -huh. and trying to be as intentional as possible at doing it so no hey, okay yeah thank you thank you for the question i see some others have joined any anyone else have any um comments or questions I don't want to just blather on, although as, as all of you know who are on the call, you know I'm capable of doing that. 
<laughs> hey, Maggie, it's, it's Melissa not? again. Yes, Melissa. Uh, can I ask another question? Yeah, go ahead. So what you're talking about, there is a level, making that transition to that fear or the the evilness that that we grow up you know so many people grow up with you know the money is evil it's it, people do bad things with it or you must if you've got money you must have done you know be a terrible person doing that to, to other people um there's a a level of mindfulness that needs to take place on a moment to moment basis in order to transition from that thought process or any thought process is really where i'm i'm, I'm fishing with this any thought process to to make that mind shift so if I wanted to, to ask this question more succinctly, it would be, is there something that you tell clients, some sort of practice or routine in order to get them to hear the triggers or hear themselves when they're, to be mindful, just how do you become more mindful? That is the succinct question. Yeah, well, so this is why we call it practice. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the thing, right? First of all, I mean, um, in the first part of this book, we, we, we say a lot about what we're not doing. Like, well, here's, here's what we're not doing. And if the person can get through the first part and say, I still want to bother to read this, that's really awesome. Because what we're saying is like, this is actually, this isn't a prosperity gospel. This isn't Tenny's steps to like get it right. This isn't you know, um, this isn't like, this is a magical formula for making you feel better. This isn't, you know, the facts are that our money system is um, fraught, to say the mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we live in a culture now increasingly, um, oh wait, my dog wants back in now. <laughs> Daddy? I feel like, I feel like, do you guys remember, I'm going to date myself. Do you guys remember Jack LaLanne? Yeah, Anybody sure. Jack LaLanne? of course. Great dog, right? My dog is like, is white like that, only about like half the size. Anyhow, okay, so, um, so a few things. First of all, we do live in a system that is rapacious, okay, meaning, you know, we, we, well, I mean, we, we live in a money system that has chosen by definition to not count the cost to human beings and to the planet. Mm -hmm. that's a, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a disputable statement. I think that's a true statement. Um, so that means money, as we think of it, gets conflated uh, and appropriately so with these more difficult things, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, we also live in now in a culture that is um, seemingly like at a culture wide level uh, has a kind of attention deficit disorder, right? Agreed. The ADD thing. And so steadying the mind long enough to go, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Or what's coming up for me? What am I feeling right now? How do I? translate that into recognizing whether that's just some voice in my head that's not helpful or whether it's actually you know an important thing to take note of or, I mean these are very difficult very difficult activities um, and they require time and attention and sort of shutting off of the constant influx of information in order to, to, to get centered enough to hear what might be coming up in your mind, let alone trying to go, okay, I'm going to review my spending and say to myself, you know, did my buying that whatever that widget is align with my values? Right. <laughs> so right, right. what I'm saying is trying to do that, trying to do that thing, like we were talking, Melissa and I had a conversation on the phone uh, just yesterday about mm -hmm. this, about um, that the that investing in different ways and investing in things that support your values is very, very important. But the real needle mover in culture and in our in this moment in history in terms of making change 
to perhaps reduce the destruction to the planet that we're experiencing um, is how we spend our money. And that, to me, that's the really, that's the most challenging frontier of anything re revolving around financial planning in, in terms of linking these money and meaning things. Because it's not just about how much you're spending, it's what are you doing with it? And is the spending giving you joy? And is it really in support of your values? And how do you know that? And how do you sort of calm yourself long enough or have enough sustained attention to both see that both retrospectively, but prospectively, like in making decisions? And how do you, you know, how do you do that? Um, I think it's, I think it's a practice, but I, um, and, it, uh, and it's not an easy practice. I don't but I think it's a really, really important. One. So, so in the end, this book isn't about like just feeling better about your money. It's sort of about embracing the complexity and treating it as, as a kind of practice um, for yourself and for, um, for others, too. If to the extent that we're trying to do less damage, like I was, you know, I'm a meat eater. <laughs> any of you want to fire me or my team, but it's true. I'm, I'm a meat eater and I was looking, I saw this article the other day about, you know, a diet that is less damaging to the planet that, you know, that reduce, you know, that isn't quite so carbon intensive. And um, I was so happy to see that like cheese has a higher carbon footprint than chicken and pork. And I sort of felt bad about that afterwards, that I was glad about that, but <laughs> You know, it's like, so I came home to Wendy, guess what? Because Wendy eats a lot of cheese. I said, <laughs> you know, mayhem ensued. And, uh, but, but not beef, May. But no, 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 you're right. You're right. Who was that? That's all. Oh, that's right. Satan, again, engaging in conversation. That's right. You're right. God help me. So, you know, we have these things we love and then we have these ways in which we say, well, what are we going to, what are we going to do and what are we not going to do? What, how are we going to make our peace with that? I, what I love about what you're saying though, is that I think that the, it's the, it's the internal and the, and the thought processes of just figuring out what it is, what, it, what, it, what, what is it that you're going to how you're going to feel and how and and getting that connection to money and being and being okay with it and then the external forces that bombard us with am i going to have a methane based uh nutrition <laughs> diet or am i going to what what is that spending going to look like so i i think what i was what i'm really excited about reading the book is finding that that correlation between the internal which is the work that i believe that the book is about um ver versus the external with I, which i think is a lot of the work that i do with clients and, fi and figuring out how to marry those two even more yeah i mean there is this there's sort of these moments in the book that's about sort of um looking in first mm -hmm. looking back mm -hmm. looking in and then looking out i like that um and so as financial planners or as in asset managers and in your job mostly where you work with people what they spend, how they spend. Um, you know that we live at that we live at this pivot point of, of looking in and yeah. looking out, right yeah we're trying to help people uh, a lot with the looking out what can they do but that requires us to have a deeper conversation or or be able to ferret out what really matters to them on the looking inside and where they're you know, where their blocks are, um, where their anxieties are, um, where they self-sabotage. Right. We'll do self-sabotage for sure. Yeah. Uh, so. Maggie, can I jump in here? This is Liz. Sure, please. Um, just, I think this relates a little bit to what you're saying so, and what you're talking about, Melissa, is that to me, the book, the main pr overall arching premise of the book is that um, at least I'll speak for myself and I think a lot of people, money has always been a sort of a separate category, conversation than all the rest, certainly than spirituality, religion, values. They were like two separate things. And um, 
it's this is an attempt to how do you bring that weave those together so that they aren't segmented i see of course there are a lot of um different ways you can do that in the, in the book so it has different practices and different ways of doing that but i think that's what we're trying to get over that um you know the idea that money is something that's completely separate from this other part of your life the spiritual yeah. part of your life so yeah thank you liz thank you liz so Maggie, I'm guessing your book explains this, but if you could just give a couple sentences on, so you talk about our money system. Are we talking about the United States? Are we talking about capitalism? Are we talking about global? Are, when you're making those references, so could you just define it just a little bit more for me? Consumer yeah. yeah, I'm really, I, I don't feel, I feel the only, <laughs> <laughs> Hold on just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Teddy. <laughs> Don't talk bad about capitalism, but it's going to happen. Just a moment. Uh, so, so um, I guess what I'm talking about is uh, the the way in which uh, I'm talking, first of all, I'm talking about the West. I don't feel qualified, I certainly don't feel qualified to speak in terms of, um, you know, uh, less developed nations and what they're going through vis-a-vis -vis the money system. So um, I guess what I'm talking about is um, the lived experience mostly of myself and my clients where every aspect of our lives, every element of our lives to get what we need to get the services we need, to get the things we need or think we need, um, all ties to this very this this um, this system of exchange, these dollars and cents now, um, and and the sort of globalization of that, the way in which it's all tied together, that there's no, it's very hard to think your way out of it. You know, if you sit for a minute and think. Well, what would be an alternative system whereby humans might flourish? And what would be involved in that? I, Just speaking for myself, I have a very hard time getting up and out of what we're calling in a way the whale. That we're in this um, and it's ubiquitous. They're really, with very few exception, um, it's very hard to imagine a life that isn't um, quite connected to this system of exchange. Now there are lives that try to seek to separate themselves completely. Um, people who live, quote unquote, off the grid, um, or um, and there have always been, even you know, over the last few thousand years, folks who would go to hermitages or monasteries, for example, and really try and live very, very simple lives and separate lives. But even there. Um, even in those instances, they were dependent on someone else to support them in some way. Or I just got done reading this great book that another client gave to me called um, Business Secrets of the Trappist Monks. Hmm. Okay. I highly recommend it, by the way. It's really fascinating. And the interesting thing about the Trappist communities, and these are written about you know living Trappist communities, is they have a mandate to support themselves. And so the way they support themselves is by making things, wine, beer, jams and jellies, uh, mushrooms, like they grow mushrooms, not the, not the psychedelic kind, but the regular kind. Um, and so they participate in the economy, but they participate in it in a very, very different way. And that's what's interesting. I mean, I read... Secrets of the Trappist Monks after we'd written this and this came out, but it was very interesting to see how they participated in this economy and yet weren't completely sucked in by it. So when I talk about this money system, I'm thinking about the ways we're all captive to, I guess what you'd call capitalism. But today I'm not even sure what we're living in is like, it's certainly not an Adam Smith capitalism anymore. It's a kind of global reach, and there's an enormous amount of control exercised 
by actually very, very few large entities that have a huge influence on our lives. Um, Amazon. <laughs> yep. Right? I mean, I love Amazon in some ways. Click, click, click. I buy pet supplies. Click, click, click. I can, you know, and that's cool, but they've become in a sense, they're like, they're this enormous monopoly that now emphasize, uh, uh, you know, it has an enormous amount of power and enormous amount of control over, over a lot of commerce. Um, so, so I'm thinking about those sorts of things. So I'm, I get is so I guess the question is: Is that capitalism, or is that something else? But it's this it's this way in which, in the absence of having money, which now today isn't something you hold in your hand, but it's actually like you know um, things that appear not even on paper anymore. By the way, <laughs> right? Yeah. This you know these things that are sort of this out in space that allow us to then go get things. I mean, this system isn't very tangible and as a and, and it's and it's has a kind of life of its own. And and I don't at this moment I can't think my way out of that. I so this book is more about, okay, given that we I, I think we can't think our way out of it at this moment, how do we live within it in a way more like the monks? kind of, with some level of distance from it, sight of it, integrity in it, um, and as a consequence, some peace with it. So, okay. Good. I don't know. I don't know if that helps you or not, but that's... Yeah, I mean, it does. It does. I mean, this whole thing has made me very curious about your book, so I'm glad I've tuned in. <laughs> that's probably part of the goal. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it, sure, uh, but, you know, it's available, God help me on Amazon, right? Oh, I know, and that's where I bought it. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, so this is the thing, but this is a, really, this is a very, it's a very, it's sort of an important object lesson, the way in which we can both go, oh, isn't there a better way to do this? And, oh, isn't this easy? So we're gonna do it. I mean, it's, I know. you know, we're conflicting. I might, might buy it, I might order it from the bookstore because, you know, Amazon will get it to me in two days. But, you know, I could order it from the independent bookseller and maybe I'd wait a week, but I could support the independent bookseller, right? So sometimes I like to make those alternatives to Amazon as part of the way I express uh, some yeah. thinking about what I want to contribute to, you know, versus the ease in which I want to do it or. Sure. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we we contacted a few independent booksellers where we had a connection, where we knew them and asked them to carry it. And, um, you know, we sort of self-promoting and uh, they have, if you come to Orcas, it's available at Orcas Island. It's available at the tiny little bookstore in Orcas Island. I was just there last week and in fact, they have it. So that's kind of awesome. nice. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? I have a or question. Yeah, I please. have a question for Liz. Um, she was, um, I know, so I can only imagine a lot of what she put into it. And I wanted to know what li how Liz was affected or, per or changed by the process um, of uh, working with you on this and applying her own gifts and talents to making it happen. Um, That's it. That's my question. How was Liz changed? Yeah, thank you, Nan. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, this was a huge uh, project for me. It was uh, a, it was challenging uh, in order because they were really Maggie's ideas. They were Maggie's stories. And I did interview her, especially for the memoir part, but also for the other parts. But I am the one who sort of put it together mm -hmm. and had to spend some time thinking about the concepts and um, fleshing them out for paper and for the rest of eternity, yeah. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and definitely I was, you know, I learned so much about my own um, situation with money um, and how I wanted to incorporate some of the practices which I have taken on. I, you know, I, it was a, I would say basically it changed me because it was a huge uh, learning experience for me as a writer, but also just learning about the concepts myself, which mm -hmm. I really, really believe in. And you know, I, you know, I'm an idealist and uh, sort of an activist at heart, and I believe that these kinds of practices, although they are for individuals to take on, that they really do have a ripple effect with the rest of society. So I, I feel very excited about it. And it was fun to write in someone else's voice. And of course, Maggie uh, helped with that too. It wasn't just, I did it all myself, but um, you know, I'm glad it, uh, somebody told me it sounded like it. Maggie's voice, and so I'm glad that it worked out that way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, but Liz. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, it was a, it was fun, and it was challenging. <laughs> and it's over. Yeah. <laughs> Except I, I would, I, I here I am putting this um, uh, out there. I'm maybe I'm glad that you're doing a study guide. I want to read this. And, um, and maybe a, a faith community that um, I belong to would um, take this up as a teaching and learning experience and that I could have something to do with. That'd be um, great. Love that. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. So yeah, we'll see. And we are hoping that we, I mean, for me, one of the most exciting outcomes so far has been the interest in this person I mentioned we're partnering with um, to to use this kind these concepts in faith communities that's you know that's yeah yeah that sounds great out you know and it's where it's the for me it's it, it's sort of full circle so I'm very excited about that definitely I think that will happen toward the end of the summer mm -hmm. so right. yeah it's happening quickly so we're excited well, I guess we're about at time. Um, I just want to thank you all very, very much for joining and for your engagement and um, uh, and for your support. Um, and uh, I, I do hope you read and enjoy it. We welcome your comments and questions after you've had a chance to look through. And um, we just look forward for, to, for more and deeper conversations as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. Have a good rest. Of all right. Bye-bye right. now. Peace. Bye. Peace. <laughs>